First of all, uh, what it turned out, I have, I have no d delusions about it. Uh, it's like having, if the, the 70s was like having All in the Family as the lead into you, uh, having that session, that amazing session before this. So I'm glad that uh, you've stayed. Um, I, susp I suppose that all of you, or most of you know, but I have to officially <clears throat> say from my CBS uh, feed here, the Supreme Court marriage is a fundamental right for gay couples, ruled this morning, 5-4. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know. So just your normal, typical 24-hour uh, news cycle. <laughs> Tony Fauci is over here. We mentioned on Face the Nation, uh, the fabulous Tony Fauci was, was on with me, I think, every single time I was on Face the Nation. And we're very lucky to have him, a uh, straight shooter in the audience, who has been astounding for this country during the Ebola crisis, the AIDS epidemic, and everything else. Yeah. So it's an honor to be here with him. <laughs> um, this is a fascinating subject for me. Uh, About 2,000 years ago, scientists in, in, in Rome uh, and in Greece figured out that if you took an electrical eel and you put it across the head of somebody who had a migraine, or if you put the uh, electric eel in a foot bath for people who had pain in their feet and poor circulation, that it actually helped. I have a feeling that the circulation thing may have been that they jumped out and they were running around and they're sort of just in running around, the blood flow increased. <laughs> but um, this is an example of an observation without understanding any kind of underlying science. And I think back then it was sort of the equivalent of kicking a television set, if you're old enough to when we used to kick the television set, you go like that and sometimes it was better and sometimes it was worse. But what you're gonna hear about to, uh, today is mind-blowing uh, to me. It is a brand new, it is gonna be the first second, I think, of course, you've been working on it for 20 years, but the first second, I think, publicly to in any kind of a big way of hearing about a whole new approach, a whole new science, a whole new way of thinking about uh, therapy uh, and even perhaps diagnostics. <clears throat> I've also learned from previous panels that I am gonna go ahead and read the introduction of each of the three panelists, just in case you haven't done so. So, quickly. Kevin Tracy is president of the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research and president and professor of the El Mezzi, did I pronounce that right? Graduate School of Molecular Medicine, a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon by training. He's credited with discovering how the brain controls the immune system's response to threat. He received the DeWitt Stetton Lectureship in 2007 from National Institute of Health and co-chaired the first International Scientific Congress addressing the inflammatory reflex. Remember that term, folks. You heard it here first, and you can hear a lot more about it. I had not heard about it until about a month ago. He's editor-in-chief of Molecular Medicine and advisory editor of the Journal of Experimental Medicine. His book, Fatal Sequence, The Killer Within, recounts the hospital course of a young patient with sepsis who changed his life. Uh, I'm going to move to the right. Monsef Slawi is chairman of GlaxoSmithKline Vaccines, a member of, of GSK's corporate executive team and board of directors. He oversees GSK's venture capital arm, SR1, and other VC partnerships, as well as its bioelectronic R&D strategy. He was previously the company's chairman of research and development, led the franchise commercial operation, and engineered the development of the vaccine pop pipeline for GSK Biologicals. Formerly an immunology professor at University of Mons, Belgium, Slaoui has authored more than 100 scientific papers and presentations. His board service includes the Pharma Foundation, uh, Cutter Foundation, National Institutes of Health Advisory Committee to the Director, and Biotechnology Industry Organization. And finally, but certainly not least, we are really honored to have Francis Collins here. He's a director of the National Institutes is the director, not only a director, but the director. I think I made Tony Fauci the director the other day, my mistake, in one of my reports. <laughs> said, what? Um, is director of the National Institutes of Health, a physician geneticist noted for his discoveries of disease genes. He led the International Human Genome Project. For those of you who don't know it, he led the International Human Genome Project. And that's going to be very relevant to our discussion today which culminated with the completion of a finished sequence of the Human DNA Instruction Book in 2003. Francis, how much did you say it cost for the first one to be uh, sequenced? About $400 million. And now? Uh, it's about 2000 Not bad. 
<laughs> Amazing. Um, Collins was director of the NIH National Human Genome Research Institute from 1993 to 2008. Prior to NIH, he was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at University of Michigan. He is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Sciences, was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2007, and received the National Medal of Science in 2009. So we've got some heavy hitters. If we can't learn something today, then we're doing something really wrong. So I'm going to start off. Um, we're going to, uh, you're going to give a, a sort of an introduction, a, sort of a five-minute brain dump um, of, to sort of bring you up to speed. And what we, we had a conversation uh, a week or two ago talking about how we would do this. And I think the best thing is to just assume that everybody, although there may be scientists, uh, tabula rasa, blank slate, and start off with sort of a primer of, you know, what are we talking about today? Making drugs. A new way. So 120 years ago, Paul Ehrlich taught the world how to make drugs. He said you begin by finding a drug target, and you screen molecules to find what he called magic bullets. In the last 120 years, the pharmaceutical industry has been doing it that way ever since. Find the molecular target that is at the heart of the disease problem, and find a molecule or a drug to hit the target to change the target's function and cure or ameliorate the disease. And this has been a, this has been a fabulous uh, strategy for a trillion dollar industry and it has enabled the cure of many diseases and the amelioration of others. But they're not magic bullets and they have side effects. And so despite the precision with which pharmaceutical approaches today and molecular biology approaches today can make highly precise molecules, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you take a precise molecule and you swallow it, or you inject it, and it goes everywhere. And you can have off-target side effects or metabolic um, side effects of the metabolism of these drugs. And so in thinking about this as a neurosurgeon who studied inflammation for 30 years, my colleagues and I came up with an alternative approach, which is to use the body's own nervous system to make the drugs. And in this model, one thinks of a cell or a molecular target, and thinks of a way, rather than finding a molecule to control that target, you find a neurotransmitter mechanism or a neuroscience mechanism to control that target. We don't think about it much, but every cell in your body, every cell in your body is close to a nerve ending. And those nerve endings have the power to change and manipulate how those cells and those molecular targets function. Can you just say what a neurotransmitter is? A neurotransmitter is the chemical released at the end of the nerve near the cell. So the electrical, the electricity, the action potentials travel down the nerve and dump the neurotransmitter next to the cell that you want to treat or the cell that's under, under control. So my colleagues and I, as the first effort to enable this idea, chose a molecule called TNF. TNF is a drug target you see advertised every Sunday afternoon if you watch football or golf. It's the molecule that Phil Mickelson talks about. It's a $50 billion drug target. 5% of the world pharmaceutical industry and growing. And so we mapped a nerve circuit that starts from the brain stem, crosses the nerves of your neck, down to your abdomen, into your spleen, and followed a path where action potentials go along these nerves and, and end in the spleen, where the neurotransmitter, the first neurotransmitter is norepinephrine is released in the spleen, which activates a specific T cell to make a second neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which floats along and bumps into the cells that make the TNF and turns them off. And let me just stop here. So TNF stands for tissue tumor or, necrosis or tumor, uh, tumor necrosis factor, and it's inflammatory. It's a, it's, a, it's a powerful molecule that drives inflammation. So today, people take TNF inhibitors for rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. So with this idea, my colleagues and I, a company I co-founded called Setpoint, did a clinical trial in Europe, and we implanted a nerve stimulator in the neck of patients. We implanted a large one, but coming, coming down the path, they'll be like this, the size of the fish oil capsule some of you swallowed this morning, hopefully. Um, and this, this sits in the neck on the nerve to drive the signal that turns off the TNF. And we put some people in remission. Um, the lay press has picked up on this, the New York Times and others, and it's getting very exciting in the last year. The scientific paper is being reviewed now. There are some scientists here. If one of you is reviewing the paper, <laughs> I'll buy you lunch, <laughs> I'll buy you drinks, whatever you need, uh, see me after this. Um, we hope that this will be a big scientific uh, report coming out in the next few months. That opportunity is not some sort of future um, jets and cars flying around thing. It's now. 
The opportunity is now. And what, and what we need to do is map these circuits because it's a scalable and, 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 and extendable approach. Pick your target, find your nerve, then make your device. And this, this approach to bioelectronic medicine is a big idea that's going to change the world. Great. And before going on to Monsef, I just want to say that just get to remind those of you who aren't scientists, most of the drugs that we have now are poisons. They work by blocking a receptor, by blocking a channel, by stopping something that normally happens from happening. This is different. This is making, it, making something that's normally in your body fire and giving it a bissel more. So, Monsef, why don't you? Thank you. Can I just uh, make a slight correction? Most of the drugs that we have today could have side effects, but they have, <laughs> they have allowed us. <laughs> They have allowed us to take our average <laughs> living uh, time from about 40 years, 120 years ago, to about 82 or 83 years today. So they have been very important. They, they will continue to be very important. Uh, I was head of R&D for a very large corporation with 16,000 scientists working. And for many years, our scientists were not able to discover enough new medicines to keep this company going. And I was charged by the board of the company to turn this around. And five, six years in that process, having had the first glimpses that things may be working, my question became not so much what is going to happen for the next uh, 10 years in this company, but what is the longer term sustainability of being able to discover new therapeutic interventions to allow people to live longer and, and, and have a better health. And clearly, for instance, the genetic breakthroughs that Francis has, has led, are allowing today the discovery of a whole series of new medicines that have the advantages we know and some of the disadvantages they have described. So we wanted to think beyond the way we discover medicines today. The way medicines today work is based on three-dimensional structure. You take a target, which is a protein in our body that has a particular shape, and we spend years discovering a chemical structure or a biological structure that we hope only fits that particular protein and no other protein. And indeed, in most cases, they fit mostly that protein, but they also touch other proteins, and sometimes there are side effects. But one of the critical points with, with the drugs as they are today is that we have to flood our body in them and hope they will only touch the targets we designed them for. They are not local. We have to rely on the patients ability to comply with taking the medicine every day, three times a day, five times a day, or every week. Uh, and we take them all the time we don't, because we don't know enough when we need them and when we don't need them when we have a chronic medicine. So we started to think, can we invent something completely different? And indeed, we realized completely independently that there is another uh, platform that uh, our body uses to engage its biology, which is electrical signals that are traveling through our nerves. So the concept of, in fact, hijacking this language that exists in our biology, and not only the language, but actually the conduit, conduit of the language, which is the nerve, and now taking the nerve and helping the nerve write a different language, a different message to the organ they're controlling. All our organs, which are mostly involved in our chronic diseases, are controlled by peripheral nerves, and so we thought, well, Let's go. Sorry, can you just define yeah. what a peripheral nerve is as opposed to the central nervous sorry. system? Sorry, the central nervous system is, our, is in our brain, highly integrated, extraordinarily complex. Peripheral nerves are stemming from uh, the brain through various uh, proceeds and go, for instance, through the vagus nerve that you have described and then branch into organs more and more specifically. And our concept is to uh, understand read the electrical language that nerves, just as they come to the spleen or to the uh, muscle of uh, controlling our lungs or into the pancreas or into our GI tract, get to that nerve, read what they're telling our organ, and if we read that something is wrong, correct it. And do that through microchips or nanochips that we would implant on that nerve. Have them very local, so they need to be very close to the organ and very specific by definition because they're very local, but also because they only correct when they read something is wrong, they would be temporarily specific. And there would be no compliance issue because they would be there with the patients all the time. 
we elected then to, how will we go about that? We scouted the world actually for a year during 2011 and found that incredible progress was made in the various scientific uh, disciplines that are required to make this happen. Material sciences, because you know, when, when you implant something in your body, uh, your body rejects it all the time. How are we gonna find materials that can survive for years or decades? Powering a structure like that, how would you harvest power and put it together? Power is not very, very friendly to biology and to life. How uh, can we understand which nerves go where and what, what part of an organ do they control? These were all questions that we realized were actually all very important. The scientific disciplines that uh, are studying them are making tremendous progress, but none of them are, nobody is integrating these sciences to put them together in a nano chip and make them effective in making this bio, uh, bioelectronic medicine. So we decided to actually foster the scientific field, become the integrator, create an open innovation approach. We created a prize. We put uh, hundreds of scientists from all continents together in a meeting. Francis, uh, you were there, and you were there too, Kevin, and, and, and really tried to advance this field. We, uh, we um, have opened this completely, so intellectual property, et cetera, is the property of, uh, of the world and of the scientific field. And enormous progress has been made over the past year and a half since, uh, since we, have, we had that meeting. I can tell you that today uh, in GlaxoSmithKline, we decided that these medicines, these therapeutic interventions, will be a reality. I can't tell you when, probably in the next five to 10 years, uh, there will be a reality. I can tell you how often they will be used. There are some challenges that we still have to fix, but they will treat chronic disorders. We have demonstrations in many, many animal models I'll be happy to share. We have also advanced the, uh, I call it the hardware, the engineering of the nano chips and all the powering issues, etc. And I'll close this by saying in front of this optimism where now we decided to invest to go into clinical trials and clinical proof of concept, there are also challenges and I'll cite a few of them. The first one is actually power, uh, powering these devices. Power creates heat. When you store power, it's hot. When it's hot, it's not good for biology. How are we gonna find out how to power these devices? There are amazing technologies I'll be happy to talk about. Mm -hmm. The second issue is actually to understand the atlas of how our organs are innervated. And we were extremely happy to see that the NIH decided to create a funding grant that Francis will be describing to you, I'm sure, in his uh, discussion to help map where fibers of our neurons go and what potentially uh, they do. And, and then the third area is actually how we connect to a nerve. Everything inside our body moves all the time. So when you connect something metallic or hard to a nerve and the nerve moves, you run the risk of potentially uh, harming that nerve. How are we gonna make these connections last for decades and years, uh, again, fascinating technologies being advanced. Those are three of the, the critical challenges these technologies, but as I said, we're very optimistic that we work. Great, thanks. Well, it's great to be here in Aspen and a privilege to be on the panel uh, with Munson <coughs> and Kevin and, and to have John, who seems to be afflicted by something that's as our capable not. moderator. <laughs> it's hyperreactive airway syndrome. I think you all know it. The bugs are dead. It's just an allergic reaction to their carcasses. Okay. <laughs> With the appropriate bioelectronic medicine, you can probably control that. Just have by the, by the end of this, people may want to just be zapping me. No, no, no. This time I will cover this. <laughs> So it's actually uh, interesting that you raised the Human Genome Project as a potential connection here, because I think we are at a juncture here uh, for this whole concept of bioelectronic medicines that sort of has the flavor where we have a lot of preliminary data, a lot of opportunity, but a lot of interesting technology that has to be pursued if we're really going to see this come into fruition. And I can't help but reflect upon the fact that 15 years ago, to the day, to the minute, I was standing next to Bill Clinton as the draft of the human genome was being announced in the East Room of the White House. That was June 26, 2000. Kind of ironic, and all of a sudden, here we are. But I think the potential here, while it is enormous, still deserves a great deal of hard work uh, to sort through what is, uh, at the present time, unfortunately, largely phenomenological, because we don't understand the details of how it all works. We know there's some pretty dramatic things that can happen. I mean, Kevin talked about his interventions for rheumatoid arthritis. How many physicians are there here in the audience? I'm curious. Well, quite a bunch. Okay, so 
I'm an internist. One of the most sort of satisfying and dramatic moments you have as a doc working in the emergency room, which I used to do a lot of, is when somebody rolls in the emergency room door who is faint, lightheaded, and has a very rapid pulse. And it turns out they have something called paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, a rapid form of heartbeat that's not terribly dangerous. It's not like VTAC, but it is very uncomfortable if you're in the middle of it. And it is possible, if all goes well for you, that you have that person simply lie down on the gurney and reach in and press with just the right amount of pressure right here on the carotid artery. And within a minute, you can break that tachycardia and that person is back to a normal rhythm. And you feel like a magician. How does that work? As long as you don't press too hard. Don't press too hard, <laughs> yes. both sides. Stro <laughs> strokes are not a good thing to have happen <laughs> under your fingers. <laughs> But how does that happen? Well, there is something called the carotid body, which is part of this peripheral nervous system, which is a very important way in which your body regulates the heart rate and the blood pressure. If we had complete control of the carotid body and could dial in or out exactly the right signals for it to send, then maybe hypertension wouldn't have to be treated with drugs anymore. Maybe it could be treated by this bioelectric approach. People have looked into that. We clearly don't know enough about how to do that safely and effectively, but that's just one of the things that we're all imagining might come out of this effort. Now, the problem is that in the carotid body and in the rest of the peripheral nervous system, our descriptions of exactly what's going on there are pretty rudimentary. If you go to Wikipedia, which I just did for fun of it, and, and looked up the vagus nerve. So what's the vagus nerve? Vagus nerve is one of the cranial nerves, comes out of the brain, it's cranial nerve number 10, and it is probably the big daddy here when it comes to what we're talking about today because it carries a lot of this parasympathetic kind of signal, the kind of thing that maybe is involved in, 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 in the immune system, is involved in gastric contractility, is involved in blood pressure and so on. The vagus, vagus for wandering, by the way, because it wanders all over the place after it leaves the brainstem. It's got all these branches. Go to Wikipedia and look it up. All the diagrams look like they were drawn in 1920. They were. Because they were. Yeah. And we haven't gotten past that. We can sort of maybe say what the path of the various branches is. And it's pretty clear that they're not quite all the same in everybody. So we have a personalized medicine issue here as well. Just got to say that. But what we really need if we're going to try to understand how to intervene is a much more sophisticated way to measure what's going on there. And that means getting the anatomy squared away, the neuroanatomy. And that is, in fact, going to require a lot of technology that we are starting to invent, but we have work to do. That vagus nerve is not a nerve. It's actually within it hundreds of thousands of individual nerves that are going to different places, some of them sending signals, some of them receiving signals. If you really wanted to understand the system, what you'd like to have is a technology, this is our dream, that you would wrap around that nerve that would actually sample everything that's going on there without interfering, that would both be able to read what's happening and also send messages to change what's happening. And do that for the individual because there are going to be differences you might want to have to tune. That's going to take uh, an incredible advance in nanotechnology to be able to do that. But there are engineers and neuroscientists that are champing at the bit to get there. So I give Kevin and Monsef a lot of credit for getting the idea of this bioelectronic medicines initiative together. And Monsef putting resources uh, from a private company into this effort and then insisting that everything has to be open access. Uh, that doesn't happen all the time and I think should be very much applauded. And we did, in fact, at that meeting a year and a half ago, conclude that it's time to really make a push here. And this is a place where NIH can make a contribution. We have something called the Common Fund, which is a part of our budget, which is intended to tackle projects that no single part of our institution could handle, but it might benefit across the board quite widely, and this seemed like a great example of that. So we have initiated a program called SPARC. It's not the greatest acronym, S-P-A-R-C. You can get the electricity feeling here, but when you find out what it stands for, it's a bit of a stretch. It's Stimulating Peripheral Activity to relieve conditions, <laughs> S-P-A-R-C. I'm sorry, it's the best we could do. We're government people, you know, give us a break. Francis, I don't have the vaguest idea how you came up with that. <laughs> oh, that was not good. 
<laughs> the Vegas right. idea. Did you get that little cute? If you have to explain uh, the joke, you're uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah, let's stop with that right now. So, uh, I, I got to say, our colleagues in DARPA are also engaged in this, the Department of Defense. They're very interested in the same people that brought you the internet and you know things like GPS uh, have also glommed onto this. They have a better acronym. Theirs is called ELECTRIX, E-L-E-C-T-R-X, get it? I wish I'd thought of that one first. <laughs> But what are we doing with Spark? That's well, we have actually dedicated, over the next seven years, $248 million. And the first notice of opportunity for applications went out. Uh, they were due in April. They're getting reviewed next month. And we will make awards in September of the first set of these, particularly focused on defining the microanatomy of the peripheral nervous system. So we have a full census of what's there, some idea of what it does, at a much more detailed nature than what we can read about in, from the 1920s, and we're still kind of stuck with that. So where will this go? I don't know what the timetable will be, but I do think um, everybody else on this panel is right. We're going to end up with interventions for obesity, for diabetes, uh, for lung disease, certainly for the immune system, um, for bladder problems, for pain, and for hypertension and cardiac issues, and probably some others that people here on this panel could mention. But how that will work, it's only going to get there if we collectively put a lot of effort into it and bring a lot of experts of various disciplines together, which will be a lot of fun. That's how the Genome Project worked. That's how this is going to work, too. There are so many exciting things about this. I don't even know where to go. But I will just start by saying it's not just about, about mapping the anatomy of where these nerves come. So if you consider them like roads and highways and little you know, streets that come off it, it's figuring out where the crossing lights are, where the flashing lights are, mm -hmm. how do you get off a highway, um, how, do, how do nerves communicate with each other, um, how do they handshake, what's the electrical way that they handshake, what are the other ways that they can handshake. Um, so the challenges are enormous. Um, I don't want to go much farther without sort of mentioning it's not just that this is a pipe dream. There are some specific examples of people who have been helped. Maybe the, the person who had rheumatoid arthritis in Europe. Who, can you t talk about that person? So the first patient was implanted Labor Day 2011. And uh, I flew to meet him over Thanksgiving weekend in 2011. Uh, he had, was a 45-year-old guy in Bosnia. And there's a picture of me and him and his doctor and nurse and I'm clearly the happiest guy in the picture. And I don't know if it's because we're all in Bosnia and I get to go home, or, or if it's because we were able to see a guy who was 45 years old and had been in his couch and unable to leave his living room for five or eight years from rheumatoid arthritis, pain in his hands, pain in his feet, unable to button his shirt. And he had exhausted the drugs available in Bosnia, which was basically methotrexate and NSAIDs. And within two weeks of implanting the device in this man, he was up and around playing with his kids and playing ping pong. Within a month, he felt so good, he went out and played tennis, which was a disaster because he had been lying on his couch for eight years and was completely deconditioned, and he hurt his knee. And he was in an arthritis trial, and they count joint pain, so his score got worse. So his doctors had to tell him, take it easy until the trial's done. Um, and that was now coming up on several years ago. He's in complete remission. He's driving a truck. He is playing with his kids. And uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing to see. And there's another patient in Amsterdam who was identified by the New York Times who have actually failed five biologics. And um, so the opportunities are happening now. And it really is exciting to see. And also, I just want to emphasize how hard it is to get a drug now to specifically go to one area. There are so few examples of where we, it works Amazingly, I guess you know radioactive iodine for somebody who has thyroid cancer because the the, the iodide gets <clears throat> taken up by the thyroid cell. So even if there's metastatic disease, it goes right to it and then it blows up the cell. It's very rare to find an example like that. And this is the opportunity to uh, to get a little more specificity. Um, Francis, I just want to start off, and I want to leave. It's 25 of them, and I want to talk for five more minutes among the, just amongst ourselves, and then open it up because I'm sure you have a lot of questions. But I feel, without too much hyperbole, this is, must be similar to the beginning of the Human Genome Project, where you have this moonshot sort of you know, possibilities in front of you. But as you said, the, the, the degrees of freedom are, are huge. And, and um, so how do you focus? How do you, what do you, th you know, when, when you came home after you first sort of got this and you were talking to your family, 
What were you saying? You know, you come on, you go, you cannot believe what's going to, and then what, did you, what followed that? Well, of course, <clears throat> scientists also have to be very careful about not overestimating uh, what the, the consequences might be or underestimating the challenges. And in this situation, I think we have enormous opportunity, but we do have a long way to go. It has the same feel as when we started the Genome Project thinking where it might go, and we still don't know the end of that story. It's developing all the time. Come to my session at 5 o'clock today, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it, it has the same kind of feel, perhaps, as what's happening in cancer right now, using genomics to be able to understand an individual tumor exactly what's driving those good cells to go bad and how could you get a targeted therapeutic, again, targeting, that goes straight to the heart of the mm -hmm. problem in that tumor and doesn't bother the normal cells. These are all the kinds of things that technology is allowing us to think about that a few years ago were outside our reach. This one has a particularly interesting feel because of the way it brings together neuroscience uh, and drug therapy, which I think uh, have had their connections, but this is a different kind of a connection. And it also has this wonderful feeling of uncovering something that has kind of been a backwater in terms of uh, our understanding of the human body and, and our focus on medical research, the so-called autonomic nervous system, sort of like one of those things you learn about in medical school and then it's okay. just this muddy thing and you didn't enjoy learning about it very much because it was muddy and you want to work on something else. Well, now it's time has come. And Monsef, we were talking last week about how the unusual collaborations that are happening here between business, the NIH, scientists. Can you talk a little bit about Yes, I about think, that? I mean, I, what, what's been fascinating is to see putting together somebody who had a lab working on material sciences uh, that were involved in, you know, how to improve devices that work in, in car engines, sports car engines, somebody that was working on powering devices that are dev designed for spying because they need to be so small they need to harvest energy from the environment. Amazingly, they harvest energy from the movement of water that's in the air. It's called piezoelectronic. And somebody who was working on creating tattoos on, on, on bodies that are themselves a microchip or a nanochip that can help you measure many of, of, of your body uh, activity, like potentially some, some uh, uh, of the yeah, technologies exactly. used in, in some of the current uh, smart watches, and put them together towards an objective that they never thought would happen, and that is now their common objective. And see how within, frankly, a year and a half, there's been tremendous progress. One of the most impressive outcome I have seen is, and this is in, 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 in rats, so it's not in humans yet, it's curing fertility, infertility, in female rats that have a particular condition, inflammatory condition in their ovaries by stimulating the nerve that goes into their ovaries. Mm. And going from infertile animals that do not have their menstrual cycle, etc., to animals that have a menstrual cycle and have puppies, as compared to those that did not have the electrical impulses in, in the neuron. To me, that was extremely impressive because it's such a, it is such a, uh, a holistic set of events that need to take place before you become pregnant and successfully achieve a pregnancy and to be able to correct something which, frankly, we don't understand. We have no idea how it works except by impacting that nerve that has changed. Uh, and it was quite complex to impact the nerve in rats for a long enough period of time for them to correct the, the, uh, the effects, one, some of the challenges. So fascinating to put a lot of scientists together uh, doing things that they didn't think they would be doing, creating a lot of energy and creativity in the system, and hopefully human uh, disease will be eliminated or at least human health will be improved. And as long as Dr. Collins was pointing to his gizmo that was well, measuring something, whatever that is, <laughs> um, I don't want to give a plug for any particular uh, Yeah, I should be careful uh, not I'm a brand. federal employee. Yeah. If I, I advocate for a product, I'll lose my job. But basically, we're all walking around, I suspect, with <clears throat> some of these wearable sensors, or many of us are, which keep track of your body's performance, the environmental exposures. This is a very significant development as well in terms of how we can maintain health, how we can manage chronic illness. Uh, it all kind of fits together, this coming together of electronics, of bioengineering, of tissue engineering, uh, of neuroscience, uh, of what we understand about the body in lots of other ways, about the brain. We have 
big initiative about the central nervous system, which is not our topic this morning, which is at least as bold, trying to figure out how those 86 billion neurons in here do what they do and what we could do to intervene when they're not performing in the way you want them. And to. it's a little amuse-bouche for precision medicine when you came to CBS a couple of months ago and we were talking about, you've got this human genome pro uh, project, we know what people's genomes are, now you've got to match it up to phenotype, you know, so what's going on in their lives? And these gizmos and maybe this technology can help us have databases, that, I know that's a scary word, databases of health, uh, which brings, that, which help us put it all together and figure out, you know, what's going to happen to who, what should we do when. But of course, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't bring up the topic that I'm sure all of you are thinking right now, which is, you've got these, you're hearing about chips implanted in bodies, so I've got to ask you, Kevin, and then we'll flip it to the audience, any possibility of people hacking into, <laughs> into other people's <laughs> neurological systems and causing mischief? <laughs> Not that anybody has that type of mentality in our planet. So devices can be hacked. And that is one of the challenges that Monsef and I have talked about. And Francis, this, this, is, this is an opportunity to think about, if, these, if, if we were to roll some of these out today, going to the doctor will become a thing of the past. Your, your chip will talk to your watch, your watch will talk to the internet, the internet will talk to your doctor, your doctor will make adjustments. But Kevin, that's happening. you know what they can't do? Your watch can't do this. I'm not trying to push out of work. <laughs> <laughs> Your watch I just can't, tell you what's your happening. Watch, no, your watch can't do this. You Correct. Can't wa your watch can't look in the person's eyes, and your watch doesn't have the hairs on the back of its neck that stand up. And even though intuition is a horrible word in these day, this day of precision <laughs> medicine, I am quite certain it will never be replaced by machines. But I love machines. I'm a computer nerd and all that. But I can't let that go by. Go ahead. That, I think the question on the table when you think of it in that way is do we need a new internet? The internet as designed by DARPA is, is a completely open network. Yeah. And I think the discussion that's happening, not just in the guise of medical devices that can be hacked, but in other technologies that people know a lot more about than I do, but should we be building a completely secure yeah. internet from the ground up? You know what Scott Pelley said to me about a month ago? He said, has the internet become one of those just neighborhoods that is so dangerous you can't go there anymore. And I, it, I just, oh, that is really an interesting thought. And when the thought of, of, and people are talking about building other networks. But anyway, with that, we'll open it up to the audience. I'm sure there are questions. Go ahead. Do we have a mic or do you need a mic? Oh, we'll, we'll implant a chip. Hold on. <laughs> Um, so I'm a current medical researcher that's about to go to medical school. This, this is awesome because I'm trying to figure out what to do and I'm in pediatric neurology and it's a really cool concept. And I love this whole integration of smart watches and chips. But going to the past into the Eastern medicine, do you guys take lessons from acupuncturists and millennia of insights on nerves and all these crossings of where to focus, you know, research on where to put these chips? So, yes. Uh, <laughs> It's fascinating to, to see uh, how potentially Epicompter has mapped points of, uh, of action that may be relating to exactly the nerve signals we're impacting. And just to bring it to today's age, I just, uh, I will not cite who, but just yesterday, I was spending time with, with a major meditation uh, guru and uh, who has a whole set of hypotheses of the impact of meditation and your breathing rhythm, et cetera, on the vagus nerve and entering into mm -hmm. metabolomics and RNA sequence uh, analysis, et cetera, to uh, document in a more scientific way the impact of, of meditation on how it impacts your health. So I do think this is an area where very old medicine and ultra new specialized medicine uh, may meet somewhere. It could really give it a jump start. All these thousands of years of observation, you'd yeah. be foolish to ignore yeah, it. Absolutely. And NIH has a whole section, a uh, whole center called the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health that has been doing these kinds of rigorous analyses of acupuncture, of other kinds of interventions, and particularly focused now on meditation and its benefits, which you can clearly show are there, but we don't understand how that works. So yeah, maybe there is a way to pull some of that together and to understand why it works when it does and why it doesn't when it doesn't. A few years ago, I met with the Dalai Lama. Sounds like an opening to a joke, a guy walks into a bar. This is a true story. Hello, Dalai. 
and I went up to um, his compound in uh, near Woodstock, New York, and spent a couple days. And uh, at the end, it was a meeting like this, and I was on the stage with Liz Blackburn, and we were summarizing two days of scientific presentations that had been made to him. And he asked me through an interpreter, he said, this, this vagus nerve, where is it? I said, well, there's, there, it runs down the neck, across your chest, and into your abdomen. And he goes, is it in the front or the back? And I said, it's in the front. And he said, is there one or two? I said, there's two. So afterwards, everyone's going around and leaving, and a monk comes up to me in long orange robe, striking, and, uh, and, and says to me, do you know why His Holiness was asking that? I said, no, I have no idea. And he said, well, there's an ancient Indo-Tibetan meditative practice where the practitioner envisions a cloud of blue energy over their head, and then they channel it into two channels down their neck, across their chest, and into their 